those ginseno sites are sweet, earthy, because American ginseng is a little cooling. It has a slight bitter aftertaste that tells us it's a little cooling. You don't get that with Chinese ginseng. There's not that slight bitterness. Okay. Okay, let's do theory. What do we do when we're sick? What do we do? How do we do this? We're upside down, we're lost, we have a midlife crisis. You know, this is just so relevant because it feels like everybody's brushing up against this right now, kind of. So I wanna like, you know, how do we navigate when we can't heal or we don't feel like we're healing, whether it's emotionally or our bodies or our lifestyle? What, what do we do? How do we navigate this? What things do we turn to? What philosophy, what underlying principles can we always fall back on? What do you think? Because it seems like everybody's been really shook up the last couple of months on some level. Mm -hmm. Okay, want me to poke and prod a little bit? <coughs> Okay, so one thing that we can do when we feel like we're what I call upside down or just lost, frustrated, don't feel like we're making progress. This could be not making progress as a overcoming our illnesses, overcoming emotions, overcoming family patterns, psychology. This could be anything, right? It's the same principle. One of the first things we always want to look at is faith. And by faith, we just mean simply here in like more of a medicine way. Do you have faith that your body has an innate ability to heal itself? Have you lost that faith? Do you really think that the Baradas, right? The green power lives in every cell of your body. Do you really think there's chi and vital energy in every cell of your being? Do you really think there's some divine, awesome, amazing power that can be woke up in like every cell of your body? Because when we're sick, we lose faith in that right away, right? So it's one of the, First things to go when we're challenged is we get challenged with our faith, our belief that we can heal. We get challenged with the lack of faith that we maybe deserve to heal. A lot of people don't feel like they deserve to be healed because they don't understand that it's everybody's birthright to feel great, right? Or to feel really, really good in body, mind, and thought. So have you ever thought about that? Do you really believe that? Because if you believe those principles, then why are we sometimes having such lack of faith in this? our body's ability to heal, right? Because we talked about what causes disease, right? There's so many causes we talked about. We know how to identify them. We know all the different angles it can take. But, you know, sometimes we don't talk about that there is just this vital life force in us that has the ability to auto-correct, auto-generate, auto-edit, right? cut and paste it can just do all kinds of amazing things we just have to find a way to support that in our constitution right our body has to have a relative balance enough for that power to kind of wake up it's often called the green dragon or the sleeping dragon inside of us uh, what are some ways we can maybe create some space for the body to heal? 
like if we're lack we've lost our faith that we can heal from something or emotionally heal for something how can we give our body just some space to actually kind of what we call activate to like wake up that potential or speed it up what's that be out in nature yeah being in nature would be a really powerful one right there is just something about being in nature that stimulates those that natural vital life force inside of us and the more raw nature is that we're in we talked about usually the more power it has right like swimming in a clean spring versus swimming in a toxic spring so being in nature is one really great way to do that. When I talk to people about my age, a lot of this concept that the body can heal is not there. Right, right. Just, just flat out not there. I, right. If you say something like that, they just look at you like, you know, what planet are you from? Right. But, um, yeah, I can think of a lot of family members, and I'm not the only one. You know, just mm -hmm. that, just whatever conventional medicine says, that's it. And my body is malfunctioning and I have to live with it and on the mark. Yeah. So, yeah, part of the, the problem why so many people have maybe not been able to tap into this is that they've never been exposed to it because, you know, sometimes Western medicine is part of natural medicine because that's where it came from. Sometimes it's radically the opposite, right? That's why the two can never really, they'll never merge completely. It's impossible because they're theoretically opposites at times. And Western medicine clearly says there is no vital life force. There is no innate healing tendency of the body. Although maybe some of the newer genetic research is starting to challenge that that you know, genes can edit, turn on and off and do all kinds of things based on all kinds of factors. So, I mean, we're starting to see some, a shift in Western medicine that um, maybe that will change somewhat, but by nature, Western medicine does not believe there's a vital life force in the body, does not believe that the body has the ability to innately heal anything. And definitely does not agree with the idea that it's your birthright to be able to heal. That term would not be used in Western medicine, right? So it's important to remember that because when you're interfacing with most of Western medicine, we're all looking for that confirmation and we're not going to find it there. And that's okay. We just have to accept that, right? That they have a set of tools and skills and you know, we can try to change the system, so to speak, but it's just important to remember, not get frustrated when we're interfacing with that system, right? In fact, if you said that to most doctors, like, oh, my body can not need to heal this, they probably look at you like, yeah, okay, whatever, take your drug, right? A lot of doctors individually definitely feel that way and know that, but they might not publicly say it though. So you know they feel that way personally. So does that make sense? So a lot of it is people just haven't maybe been exposed to this, read some of those things. Just they never got, like I said, um, I always like saying, we never got the instruction manual with our body when we were born, which a lot of these cultures have held that wisdom, but we never like got the book though. And now we just have pieces of that user manual that we have still. So it's important to remember when you're feeling really out of sorts to really just have faith in that fact alone, that your body has the ability to heal and restore. Because when we don't have that ability, it sends us into panic mode. It sends us into doubt mode, right? Because then even if we're getting better, every symptom we have is like blowing up. It's touching this fear we have, right? Because we don't have that. 
Western medicine also doesn't like that mindset because that's like a very empowering mindset, right? That's not necessarily good for drug companies if we think that way or we remember to think that way, right? So that's kind of why Western medicine is somewhat like opposed to that idea. And we just have to kind of accept that. What else? What else can we do to kind of tap into this trust? Maybe, yeah, Paulette, one of the teachers at the massage school, she has a really fun thing saying, um, trust the process. I've always liked that saying, trust the process, right? Trust the process. We also often have to have faith that when disease strikes, it never strikes in a haphazard, random moving way. There's always uh, an intelligence about it. There's a timing about it. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a bad thought about it. Like, you know, I caused this um, bad, my mind was so weak, I caused this problem. Here we're just talking about, just know that there's a timing for everything with the constitution. Remember the constitution is alive, it's functioning, it has a consciousness of its own. It's regulating our body, it's bringing people into our lives, it's um, giving us symptoms, it's giving us cravings, it's doing all this. So we have to also have faith that when something comes up, it is, there is some kind of purpose or function to it. <clears throat> when disease is really serious, that can be not the most comforting idea, right? Because like when people have cancer, they don't even care about that idea. They just want it better, right? Would be a good example of that. So, so it's important as we're healing to try to unravel maybe why at this particular time of life do we have this set of symptoms? And what does it mean, right? What does it mean? And that's where we have to have some faith some trust and it takes time to unravel some of that right because it's often not until we heal that we see the the beauty of how how that was you know like a lot of people that have cancer who end up like <clears throat> having and by success we mean they just were able to live a really fulfilled life not putting like a time on it they're often, you know, we'll talk about how cancer really pushed them to just kind of drop everything and just focus on family, loved ones, and really focus on quality time and moments. I can't tell you how many people just said that again and again and again. Maybe they didn't live for another 50 years, but they were able to like really embrace that and be very like fulfilled in it too and find peace in that. So we also have to have faith that things might not always look and show up the way we would like, right? Like when tests come, whether they're psychological or physical, we kind of always have an idea like, you know, how we want them to show up, but we don't always like the way they show up. Maybe it shows up really scary, or maybe they show up in a way that touches us. Like, you know, if you have a family history of colon cancer and you start having colon symptoms, that's gonna like touch you in a way that might be way more powerful than someone that's never had colon cancer in their family history. <clears throat> so again, we just kind of have to have faith that there is some kind of order in all of it. And that's challenging. We, we've talked about before avoiding this really grief stricken idea that <clears throat> a lot of people in the healing arts get into where, you know, telling people they cause their diseases and things. And that leads to like guiltiness and feeling of shame. We don't, we don't want to do that, right? Where we want to inspire people and give people hope. So we can talk about these things in a way that has a positive spin, 
so people don't feel like, oh my gosh, I did all this. Why would I do this? This is so bad. Yeah. But, but What's that? I mean, isn't some disease caused by what we do? Sure. Yeah. Clear so, about that with them. That yeah. So we want to have. Or it's not gonna. Yeah. We want to have education. We just want to. We just want to avoid people from beating themselves up more. I guess. So we can be honest, and they can be honest with themselves. But. Um, but have some grace. With it. Yeah, have grace with it. There's just like this mentality that takes over in the kind of like the healing arts community where people get really like a little too harsh on people. <clears throat> it's like a destructive mindset that seeps in. It usually comes from like, you know, I'm a healer, I know everything. And I'm kind of like telling you, you need to listen to this now and created the, you know, it's like a little bit of like an ego thing. But you want to avoid. We also have to remember that literally every second is a freaking miracle. The fact that a billion cells in us can all collectively function together, do a billion tasks every second, and do this thing called us like that. They, if you don't believe in miracles, I mean, you could just look at your body, it's, that's all the proof you need. I mean, there's thousands and millions more proof, but. So we have to have faith that this we this is like a miraculous thing that's happening. Every second is a miracle that we're living, breathing, alive. So that should be a really inspirational thought for us, right? So what else can we do to kind of like help stimulate this vital response when we're feeling just out of it? Meditation. Meditation, we know historically is really powerful. And specifically in Chinese medicine, we say the quieter we get, the dragon wakes up. Meaning the more peaceful we can get in our thoughts, whether it's meditation or contemplation or being quiet in nature or prayer, whatever it is that gets us to that quiet place, that's when this vital life force really starts to go wild in a good way. Probably one of the most important things. What else? About laughing, just checking out of how serious life is and just remember to just go have fun and laugh. Yeah. These guys feeling like really like, what is going on? Wow, well, like this, it's just screw it. I'm just gonna go out and have fun with my friends and totally forget about every health thing ever, forget about everything, and it totally worked. Like the next day, I felt like totally fine. I had no physical symptoms, it just went out. I call it blow out the cobwebs, just go have fun, get in the moment, forget about anything serious whatsoever, just go do it. Um, <clears throat> that's a good way to do that. Okay, what else can we do? Sleep. Sleep or rest, which is like a type of getting quiet, right? So again, by resting, it's hard for Americans to believe by resting our body's natural ability to heal is activated when we're resting. So for people that have insomnia in that, that can be a really frustrating process too because we need that sleep to create that healing, right? Anything else that we can do to like kind of speed up or activate those parts of ourselves? What's that, journaling? Yeah, journaling or giving back or volunteering. Yeah, so volunteering, acts of service, right? Are a great way to forget about you and focus on something beyond you. Mm -hmm. Journaling, that's a great way to get all those emotions out of our 
mind. So diet, like, like all these things we've talked about are gonna support this process, right? The whole gamut of what we've talked about so far. But just remember, it is often about faith, okay? What else? Another thing that we always forget is that when we are trying to heal or we're stuck or we're in a midlife crisis, emotional crisis, physical crisis, is that the one foundational force is usually the very thing that scares the crap out of us. And that is change, right? Doing, you know, often stupidity is described as doing the same thing over again and again and expecting a different outcome than before. Mm -hmm. So change, but when change happens, it usually scares us though, right? Because that means probably our diet or lifestyle is going to be changing. Okay, and now just for example, all our friends are going to be like, what, you just don't drink anymore? What? That's weird. You're turning weird on us. Are you joining a cult or what? Like, what's going on? Right? Or change, like you're going to maybe have a lot of emotions come up that feels bad, but it's really just the change happening, right? You're processing you're working through, you know, 18 years of trauma or something, you're working through 18 years. Our roles are probably going to change. Your role is like a father, a mother, a daughter, you know, a coworker, a friend, like all your roles can start to shift as we need to heal. You know, usually we'll hit a crisis first, right? So there's going to be a change, and that can be a little bit scary. How our body feels as it heals can be a change, right? We, we know this through cleansing. We get all kinds of detox stuff. Like a lot of people, the first time they experience that discomfort, like, oh, I got it. This is scary. Partially just because they don't know what to expect or why, so it becomes more scary. So when we heal, often change can happen and it can make us uncomfortable. So just one of the things we need to think of when we're stuck is that change is a good thing. And you know, asking ourselves what needs to change was our diet, our lifestyle, our thoughts our relationships, our careers, the way we do our career, the way we think about our career, the way we act as a parent or don't act or all these things, right? We have to accept that maybe supplements or medications or things we were taking but just weren't working for us. We have to like just accept that maybe we need a different kind of protocol or shakeup. Maybe the counselor we had just wasn't not the right fit for us anymore, right? Maybe it was, now it's not. So we just have to be okay of change. Friends leaving, friends coming and going, that can be really upsetting to people, right? Uh, because often when people are really healing, going through change, like everyone just <laughs> often checks out of your life, it feels like. Then you're in the dark, the dark, uh, sweet chestnut, remember, flower essence, the dark night of the soul. It's like, oh, everything is going to happen like right now. So what else could change or what else might we need to change? Maybe just our thoughts about philosophy. Like this, maybe we need to change our thoughts that yes, we need to once again believe that the body can heal itself. We need to be reminded of that. We need to put that as a positive affirmation. We wake up every day and say, my body can heal and restore. I always say a lot of this is like the, remember when we were younger, there was always the cigarette in the glass, little jar that said like break in case of emergency. Like I always say, this is like your glass cigarette 
protocol? Like, what do you do if you just like an emergency? I can't heal. What are you gonna do right now to like do something? Change. Okay. But it's important to know all of us psychologically as humans were wired for this, we want this. This is what we want. And I'm as guilty as anybody of this. <laughs> as a Kafa person, this is what we want. Right? We want life to be like this. A lot of us, not everybody, like Pitta's, you know, might want some little more variety than a lot of us Kafas, but you know, life is going to have, you know, some ups and downs, some flat lines. It's not going to be like an EKG, right? Mildly bumpy time, big bumpy time, midlife crisis, right? So to speak. This is just kind of how life goes. Um, what one thing that we can do as we learn to change our diet and lifestyle and like have a holistic life we see that life starts to do this little smooth slow steady ups and downs right that makes sense we start to learn to have skills you know where we start to feel out of balance and then we can like kind of pull ourselves back but there's still going to be probably a time where we have a little whoop. So change. So we, we, we also have to accept as part of change that this is hard for maybe, maybe it's a Kafa thing. Maybe it's like an earth thing that I have. Cause I, I would like everything to be that way. I really would. It would be really kind of fun. Um, do, 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 do. I can walk like this every day. Oh, just lollygagging around, being like a bear. Um, we just learn to develop skills. People take drugs to do this. This is why people do drugs. They want to create a consistent, even though to us, drugs might look like this. <laughs> To them, it feels like this, right? You know, people get into bad relationships because although it, it feels like this to us and on the outside to them, it feels like, well, this is comfortable. I know this, this is like a comfortable feeling. So we're all addicted to this in a sense. And as humans, we're all wired to not like this. That's just what we're up against. And we just have to accept that and, and be okay with it more, right? To know that change and ebbs and flows are just going to be part of it. Hopefully our lives don't look like that, but, you know, hopefully we can maintain something that looks like this. Does that make sense? There's always going to be change. That's the only inevitable part of it all. Um, by learning to proact, it's often been said that we are an active partner in change instead of being a victim of change. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean by that? So by using preventative health or psychological health and positive affirmations and lifestyle, we become a co-creative force in how this change looks and feel Otherwise, we're just kind of like a victim to responding to it. Does that make sense? So there is a big role in preventative health. So we have to just be okay with change. This really bothers a lot of patients that are really sick. They just, they just don't like the change. You know, they're having to change so much. And I think as... We have to help people recognize that and just call it out. Be like, this is a lot of change in your life. And just tell them that because sometimes no one has said that to them. And just be like, this is a lot for anybody. Be okay with that. Just know that that's a lot for anybody to try to process at once and just be okay with that. 
Any other insights about change or not changing or changing that people want to make? I mean, gratitude for the good stuff we have. So having an attitude of gratitude is really helpful, especially when we're experiencing this. So, you know, the thing about stress is that it's all relative, right? So, meaning, maybe as a person that has gratitude or a positive state of mind, these two people might have the exact same measurable level of stress, this person and this person. But because stress is relative to our own mind, right? This is how it feels to one person, and this is how it feels to the other person. And often that's just a state of mind too, of having gratitude, right? But being thankful for change and ups and downs and just knowing that that's part of the process. Because darn it, that was my idea of enlightenment growing up, right? Did the work. Around about 45, I was going to become enlightened. And then it's just <laughs> nothing else after that. Just bliss. That's truly what I thought. About 45, probably, is what I thought when I was a younger version of myself. And I remember learning, like, that's not that way. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember I was at a retreat and I just actually took off running. I couldn't stop running. So I just like couldn't, it just like was so heavy to know that. I mean, I'm gonna have to like grow my entire life and be challenged and, right? It was really rough. It was quite rough. And to know maybe that the more spiritual you get, the bigger the challenges are often, right? That's something that we see in life, you know, that happens a lot with people. So remember too, yeah, the state of mind that we have or the gratitude in our mind that we have can make the same amount of stress seem totally different for two people. Right? That's also why we never get into pissing contests with stress, right? Well, you know, a lot of people are like, my trauma is you know, I know that person has trauma, but my trauma is like higher level. Like that's just really bad thinking. Like, like my family genetics are way worse than this person. So therefore I really have it rougher than that. So I never wanted to get into contests with other people. Hey, the other part of healing, right? that we see that's similar to change is just, and this is a stressful one, is crisis is part of every healing process. God darn it, that just does not seem fair, <laughs> right? It's kind of different than how we're led to believe. We are led to believe like in this level even, right? That's how we're going to heal and have a transformation but there's always some kind of crisis but that's why we try to get rid of the word crisis and say opportunity right it's just an opportunity it's a point in time it's not a crisis because it's crisis infers that it's a bad thing it's just we have an opportunity to do something here or something's happening right? But every healing process has crisis. That's why we know when people, ourselves or clients that we're working with, a family member, people come in like, yeah, I had this disease, it's gone. And it, it looked like this, just, you know, just got better. It's fine. Like every day it's got a little better. All you know, something's going to happen sooner or later. I mean, I don't, it's hard to talk to sometimes people about it. It's like, okay, how do you capture this positivity? You're like, okay, you upgraded your life, you upgraded your diet, you upgraded your body. But you know, sooner or later, there has to be a crisis in healing. It's just the way it works, right? 
So sooner or later, there's going to be something. And the more we can kind of prepare people for that, the better equipped they'll be to not panic when that happens, right? Yes, say you had. That would be a little hard to prepare people because even though you understand, things can happen. You don't know what the things are that are going to happen. Right, right. Yeah, and maybe that's like the best definition of a crisis is that it is like anything could happen. I mean, we know detox what a healing crisis looks like, but we don't always know what a crisis is going to look like in somebody's body all the time. It's just a moment, right, where all the old toxins are letting go and the physical trauma and all the organ stuff and lymph, like we just know that the crisis, you know, sometimes that's going to like just be a big event for the body. So often it's the letdown afterwards, right? Did your cleanse and you're kind of done after cleanse and then sometimes it hits you like afterwards, after you finally like whew, relax. Like this happens a lot like with chemotherapy and radiation, people like just Willpower, going to willpower through it, which is good. That's great, right? You have the mind that's strong enough to do that. But then you know, okay, I got 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 the got the scans. Everything's fine. Done treatment, and then it's about about two weeks after that, it just hits. They go through this just like physical purging that happens, an emotional purging, and they finally let down and relax and then everything it's like a mini crisis in a sense you see that a lot of people right where you quit smoking right and you feel so good and then all of a sudden you know like a year or two later there's this event sooner or later all that tar and crap's got to come out right and all of a sudden it just it finally just chooses to come out it's the body's intelligence who knows why at that time and it just crashes out and that's a crisis, right? It's a good thing. Crisis is just that moment of transformation, right? So counselors will say it's not a crisis, it's an awareness shift, right? You're just becoming more aware of something that was there before. Because we know our constitution is only letting us feel so much at a time. So, you know, this stuff is always there. We just might not feel it. Okay. So, crisis is, yes, an alchemical process. But a lot of times, these crises involve really our identity. That's the identity. Right. Okay, I had cancer, I beat that, I did that. Well, who the hell am I now? Because like before cancer, I was something and then I became a cancer person. And now it's gone and people just have this identity crisis. Well, what am I gonna be? But like, I, I quit my job to be with my family. What's, what's going on here? So our identity can become in crisis, and that can be really difficult. Right. Maybe you are Mr. or Mrs. Successful business person making X amount of money, had X amount of titles, and then just dropped it. Now, who are you, right? So, I always love talking to people like after they retire, you know, you can see how like close even when you meet people like hey how you doing yeah i'm retired yeah, i was a football coach my whole career you know like it instantly comes out like in like a second because how closely some people hold their identity really tight you know yes i know every time i talk to you neighbor i've you've mentioned within one minute you were a football coach your entire life i know it was really cool um maybe you should think maybe like what are you doing now what are you doing now so a lot of people, doctors, after they quit doctoring, they can't stand not being doctor so and so. Just you're now Joe. Right? That just bothers a lot of people. So, 
that's why a lot of people have a crisis after retirement because they have lost their identity. Okay. okay. Another thing we have to remember is that one of the most, there's ingredients for healing, just like making a soup, right? It's ingredients. So change is always going to happen. There's always going to be some kind of a crisis and a true healing, right? The other thing is one of the key ingredients of healing is so simple and so basic. It is your authentic self. This is in every healing process. No matter how much we think we know our true self, every healing journey disease process involves rethinking that or maybe connecting with our true self at a deeper level. And in one hand, it's so simple. Really understanding who we truly, truly are, because that's our constitution, right? And just letting that thing that we are out at 100%, 110%. Let it out and let it guide your life. Easiest thing ever been said. <laughs> hardest thing, one of the hardest things to do in practice, right? You remember when we talked about tension, we said that all tension is your true self in, you know, fighting with tension with the mask that we have on. All tension, all stress arises from that. In, in theory. So, so the first though, to do that, we have to know who is our authentic self, because some of us don't even know any parts of our who we really are, right? These are like our true self. We have to kind of like identify that, because a lot of who we think we are is really just who our parents wanted us to be, our teachers, society, different people we value highly. That's who they want us to be, right? And we carry all this inside of us, this tension. We're really trying to only let out so much of our real self because we're really just afraid what everybody's gonna say. Is somebody, everybody really gonna love us when we're really our true self? That's like the deep fear. When you let your wild flag fly, right? Your true self fly. We're all, I mean, we're all trying to move towards this, right? So in a sense, we could say that healing is really moving towards your authentic self and falling into a disease process or a psychological crisis is moving away from our authentic self, right? We're in a relationship and we just know it's not good for us, but we really want to feel something like this. Okay. Confidence would be an extension of finding like our true self, right? Those traits that are us. And because it's your constitution, it could be anything. Maybe you're an artist, maybe you're a poet, Maybe you just like to be in nature. I mean, you like to walk your dogs. I mean, you like to talk to dogs. It could be anything, right? Any, we could have a hundred aspects of ourselves, but we want to ideally let them all out. And then we also want to find harmony with all the parts of ourself. That's another part of it. Because some of them might seem a little in conflict, right? Right, I'm a Gemini. I love to be alone. I love to party. I love them both, but only at certain times do I like one or the other. So I have to find that. I have to balance that, right? I have to accept that I have two sides that are totally opposite. And depending on certain mood or situation, I may feel better in one or the other and honor that. So, right? You could be an artist and you could be like a super business person. Those might seem like conflicted. So we have to reconcile all these parts of ourselves too. Right. Okay. 
so we can ask these deep things like who we are. We, we talked about this in the depression class. What if we don't know anything about this, finding out who we are and we don't have access to counselors? Like, how do we do this? What do we do to find out who our true self is? The, the, one of the easiest things we can all do, <clears throat> again, is like the 25 happy list, right? We're going to actually just remember what makes us happy, every little or big thing. And then we're just going to start doing it. We're going to connect because something that makes us happy is feeding an authentic part of ourselves. We're going to allow this part of ourselves to be fed and we just feel happy when it happens. That's all you need, we need to know. We don't have to really counsel about it or do deep therapy. We just know this feels really happy and joyful to do art or to paint or walk in nature, whatever it is, to wear something fashionable maybe for you. And then we just start doing more of those things, right? So we have our authentic self, and then what's the opposite of our authentic self? Just to review for theory. We have our authentic self. This is where the challenge lies, right? And then we have our shadow. Our subconscious. These two are in direct, constant. I don't want to use the word battle because we never use the word, we never use war themes in healing, right? That's not good. They're in a constant dance. Because our shadow self, our destructive side, which we all have a part of is always trying to move away from this authentic. So I don't know why it works that way. It's just the way it works. They're just opposites. Typically, our shadow follows the rule of logic. When we find ourselves acting very responsible and uber logical, and we're having stress because we're locked into some I'm going to take on the stress of the world because of this, you know, logical thing. It's usually our shadow self. You know, our authentic self often behaves very illogical. I like to do art or do things that somebody thinks is really weird, like brew beer or who knows. <clears throat> so often when we're doing something where people say, well, that seems kind of unusual. That's usually a good sign we're on the right track, right? Or that seems unusual for you. I've never heard of you wanting to brew beer. That's unusual. Yeah, I've wanted to do it since I was, you know, in college. I'm 75 now, I want to do it. So there's always this dance between the two. So we want to try to feed this as much as we can and not feed that side as much as we can. Typically when people go, we say to, they say you can never achieve 100% authentic self. It's just like, because there's always part of your shadow that just sticks on and won't let go. So in theory, like let's say you go to 99%. What usually happens is people here actually look crazy to a lot of people. Why is that guy or girl so happy? What is going on with them? That's so suspicious. Why are they so happy at the grocery store talking to me? I don't like that. That's suspicious. That person's probably a psychopathic <laughs> serial killer. I've seen enough Netflix specials on Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> I know. This is the side of a serial killer. This is where our shadow side goes. I'm not going to trust anything that looks too good to be true. That this person could just be genuinely happy. 
the shadow has to sabotage it and turn it into something really bad. But typically we know when we're getting here because we start doing things we've never did before and excited about doing things we've never did before or um, getting excited about really, really little things. Like, oh, yay, today I, I go to the animal shelter and volunteer. Like I've wanted all my life to do this and now I get to go walk dogs today. So that's when we know we're getting there. We're doing things that are exciting, fun, making us feel joyful. And people around us that have known us are kind of looking at us like, ooh, suspicious. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to trust that, especially in a society that glorifies the shadow self being different? Yeah. It's just just even knowing that that dance is always there is just just knowing it's it's always gonna show up in different ways and always try to sabotage your thinking. And just kind of just I think awareness of the fact that it's there is one of the most helpful things. Remember, we're never going to get rid of that shadow. That's kind of like a hard thing to process too, right? We're always going to have some addictive part of our being, no matter how much we work on it. Whether it's food or alcohol or clothes or whatever it is, we're just not going to feed it much. That's all. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to end class with today is one of my all-time favorite books that I think is like one of the best guides for all this is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, which I don't know how many people in class have read that. Oh, really? Only a couple? Really? One of the best little books ever written. It gets a little wordy, but the basic idea is so powerful. So he's like a Native American elder who wrote this kind of based on like their <clears throat> Native wisdom. But I like it because it's so simple and it rings true uh, throughout everything we've talked about with the healing process. And to me, it's like a really good, this is like how you, to me, you catch your shadow constantly. Or if you're feeling stuck, this is a good checklist to go through one, two, three, four. Because I guarantee you, one of the four just he walked into it. So, so he has this idea called the four agreements. That's not his, it comes from his native culture. But there's just the idea that we all have authentic self and a shadow. Um, he calls the shadow the internal judge and says it as often as formed in childhood because we're trying to learn to get the attention of people around us and to have, you know, different needs met, but then it kind of turns into like an internal judge is another, is a word he uses for the shadow, the internal judge. Okay, it's basically gonna try to find a fault with everything we do, right? So step or agreement one, is always be impeccable with your word. So this can mean a lot of things, right? One, it means we're going to really value what we say, and we're going to stand by that, right? Or word, right? If we say we're going to be somewhere at a certain time, we're going to do our best to be there, right? So we're not going to lie. We're not going to try to deceive people. But we're not going to deceive ourselves. But also that we want to use words in a positive way, which we have already talked about in class we call positive affirmations, right? So we're going to use the power of word to really start to create a new life for us. The rule here is we don't use words to harm ourselves and we don't use words to harm others, right? We 
because we know with the shadow that if we're using words to attack others, we're actually just attacking ourselves. Right? Everything is the opposite reaction. So we're going to use words to have these positive intents. If we remember the triangle game that Master Chen talked about, here we have judge. We are not going to be a judge to ourselves or other people. We're getting out of that role, get out of that role, right? So often when we say we're gonna do something or we say something negative, even if we don't necessarily like we're gossiping or something, right? Um, that's all gonna come back to like sabotage us somehow. So we want, this is probably the easiest one of all to just really be careful of what we say. To think before we maybe speak about someone or ourselves too. We want to be gentle on ourselves. Number two, the most challenging and most important, don't take anything personally. This is one of the most important guidelines ever. Remember from that triangle game, don't allow yourself to be the victim. The idea is that we can never know someone's intent of what they said or did. Don't take anything personally anybody does. Even if somebody did something extreme like hurt you, it's not about you, it's about the trauma, the disease that is in them, right? Mm -hmm. This is how victims are made, right? Because you're in an abusive relationship and you think it's your fault, right? You took it personally. Oh, I should never did that or said that. Well, you have no right to ever be beat, right? That's just period. So we don't, but here we're talking about do not take anything personally, anything anybody says to you, anything, right? <laughs> I was talking with Michelle about this last week. Like last week, this is always going up. We're always internalizing everything in our head, right? Especially if you're empathic. We really care about what people think about you. It's even worse, right? So this is an example of how, like I thought about this the other day. <clears throat> I have this neighbor, I don't know. He's kind of like standoffish. She has two kids. I think one's probably like autistic or something. So last week I noticed I'm watching the kids play outside and there's this third boy that this was like playing with the girls. And I was like, hmm, that was probably another kid. So like went outside to go make sure his dad didn't think he ran off or something. Sure enough, my intuition was right. His dad, I saw him go like peel out into the backyard and start yelling, looking for a son. So I walked over there and I said, are you looking for your son? Cause I never really met the guy yet. Um, he's like, yeah, he looked kind of just puffed up. And um, so I'm like, he's in the backyard playing with the girls. So he's walking back, not really just, stone colding me you know i'm like oh gosh you know, this guy's gonna say something whatever uh goes in the backyard the kids are all laughing giggling on the trampoline still doesn't say much and just kind of storms off and like that's our interaction <laughs> so like the next day i get this <laughs> letter in my mailbox that's handwritten i'm like oh it's the guy he's gonna be upset that i let the kid his son in my backyard and blah 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 it was my lawn mowing bill <laughs> and then the next day the kid shows up and knocks on her door and wants to play with my daughters <laughs> so it's like just the idea that it's so easy to take everything personal or to assume someone's mad at you upset at you what did i do what did i say and we just have to stop that that's like the hardest one of the best to me this is the most important of all the guidelines just don't take it personally, no matter what someone says to you, even if it's mean, I've been called every word in the world ever. I've had every rumor made about me in my life. I've been a cocaine dealer. I can just tell you the things <laughs> that I've been in my life, according to what other people have said. And we just can't take it.
personally. And it gets back to Master Chen saying that don't allow yourself to be the victim. Right? Okay. To take it personally, Don Miguel says, is called getting poisoned. You have been poisoned. The other part of this too is um, having compassion. Like when people are saying negative things or giving us what we would call negative energy or something, just to have compassion. No, it's all about them. That's their own life. They're going to project, people are going to project their own stuff on us. It's just part of human life. We're going to have rumors made about us and all this stuff. I mean, we can choose to navigate it how we want, but just, just don't take it personally. I have no idea why rumors get. Uh, growing up in a small town, it just, it like fascinates the heck out of me to this day. How rumors start and why people would do it. I remember even knowing someone started a rumor. It's like, you know, it's like going and confronting them and like trying to get in their headspace. And it's like, it just, I never understood why. Yeah, I didn't witness people starting rumors, you know. And I, I'm really good about this. Like if people tell me a rumor, it's like, Oh, did somebody say that to you? Did you see that directly? Did you actually see them sell drugs? Or did you actually <laughs> see them do that? Or did you hear those words come out of mouth? Well, no, but somebody told me like, well, I'm going to wait until I actually can talk to this person. So it's also important to like live your life in a way, right? To not take stuff personally. Okay. That's actually more getting into the third rule is don't make assumptions, which is part of this, right? We can never know why people behave the way they do. I mean, how many Netflix mass murder documentaries have you seen? And people are still just like, I don't know why Jeffrey Dahmer's did that. It's just crazy. Okay. Or how he could even do that, but just don't make any assumption about anybody else. This has a lot to do with communication. So this one we often diffuse by communication, right? Well, I assume, you know, by the way your energy looks, you know, you're bothering, you're upset at me, are you upset at me? Just like direct communication. This is like one of the easier ones to diffuse by just directly asking people. You know, I'm going to assume you didn't start that rumor about me, but you're going to like directly talk to a person, right? The goal is communication. Also communicating our needs, right? Like I have a need to, you know, feel safe. I have a need to feel like you're listening to me or so oh, this whole assumption thing revolves around can be diffused through proper communication most of the time. It's a great way to diffuse stress. It's just a direct communication. So this can show up in so many ways, right? <clears throat> this can show up in the healing profession. You see a lot of people that are in counseling all of a sudden sabotage their counseling. Like, well, my last session, my counselor, she didn't seem very compassionate. Or maybe she said something that was like very hurtful or direct. So like we, our shadow throws up these things, you know, we're making an assumption all of a sudden they don't, our counselor doesn't like us anymore. So then we quit seeing that and our shadow gets stronger, right? Because we sabotaged it. So we don't want to make assumptions. 
it's a really good parenting rule too, right? To don't assume your kids are doing or acting a way without directly just saying, hey, why are you, why are you doing this? Right? Questions on that? This one's probably the hardest for people because we all take this personally, right? It's part of the way our mind is kind of wired. So questions on that? Often the hero comes in here at the triangle game, right? Oh, you're upset. I'm going to be the hero and I'm going to come in and make the situation perfect. Or you're stressed and worried and I'm going to come in and overstep my bounds and be your hero, right? So often making assumptions gets the hero part of ourself, which is goodwill in nature, into a lot of trouble. Okay. Okay. And the fourth one is <clears throat> do your best. Do your best, give it your all. But then after that, it's just, that's it, it's done. You did your best. If it didn't work, well, you did your best. Just tell yourself that, dust yourself off and say, I did my best. But I've had a lot of negative interactions with people or people in the world or stressful things. It's the first thing I say, okay, did I do my best? I did my best I could. But I did my best to try to remedy this. I'm just gonna wash my hands of it. I did my best. <clears throat> Wasn't perfect, but I did my best, right? So to remind ourselves that we tried our best, we tried our hardest, and that's all that we can do. So again, this kind of speaks a lot to the confidence we have to have in ourselves. Because if we hate ourselves, we don't like ourselves, we're going to judge ourselves so much, right? So we do our best, and then we walk away. A lot of this has also to do with understanding when to push, push ourselves, and when maybe we're over pushing ourselves. Like, yes, it's good to have a business, but it, it's not good to work like 80 hours a week. That's, are you really doing your best or you're just like, you're just overworking? So we can kind of examine the activities that we're doing in our life in this way. Part of what Don Miguel is saying here too, if you read a lot of his writings, is that we're just letting go of this idea of perfection, which is horrible. We're just letting go of perfection. We're not being perfectionist anymore. And we're not going to hold hold ourselves to some perfectionist idea. And something that he means by this too is that by doing your best, he is also often talking about being in the moment. You're just doing your best, but you're in the moment. You're in that flow state, or you're trying to get to that flow state where you're in it, doing the best you can, you're engaged in life, you're not hiding from life, doing your best. I remember when I went to go see Don Miguel Ruiz, um, I got settled in, I got nestled in, and who comes out? Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., not the original. So my whole ego is like, <laughs> I have just was so upset. And then I just, I just sat with it for a while. And then it was like a beautiful, he did a beautiful job. He, the whole place was crying and bawling by the end of his one hour lecture. It was really beautiful. But just, you know, a good reminder. No victim, don't take it personally. Don Miguel Ruiz didn't try to hurt me by not showing up, right? <laughs> Not <clears throat> that was my assumption, maybe somewhere deep inside. 
Well, it's a really good book to read. A lot of it's very verbose in the sense of this is like the main part of it, but he does a really good job of explaining it. I love the word, yeah, he calls the shadow the parasite too. Because it's, you know, a parasite sucks our vital energy and that's what the shadow does. It takes our energy away. It's a really good book to read. I know you guys have a lot of homework and stuff right now, but it's a really good book to read. The last other piece of thing I want to leave you with is, well, remember in Chinese medicine, we talked about that saying that uh, um, man is, or human is united with heaven and earth. And that is a, what I like to think of a lot when I'm feeling out of balance and like I'm not able to overcome something that I try to put myself <clears throat> visually back into this harmony where I'm harmonizing my body with the earth and the, whether you want to say heaven or the cosmos or whatever it is, I'm just, I'm harmonizing all those parts of myself into you unifying and harmonizing those. I'm gonna to try to live my life in a way that would be reflective of that. I mean, I definitely don't do that every day, but I mean, that's what I'm trying to do when I'm feeling really out of balance, to put myself into that state of mind. Okay. Questions, ideas? Good food for thought. We're all gonna have crises, we're all gonna have breakdowns, we're all gonna have beginning life crisis, midlife, later life, every stage of life has some kind of crisis. So just be realistic to know that they're gonna happen, they're gonna catch us off guard. They're usually always happen at inopportune times, according to us. And just have a whole system in place of how you can get back into balance right away and navigate it. Whether it's Zelda or the new Lord of the Rings. How many people like the new Lord of the Rings series on Amazon? I know a lot of true Lord of Ringers don't like it, but <clears throat> I like it. It's kind of fun. Okay. I tried to watch the Dahmer thing. It's got too weird got too weird right away the Netflix special I just I don't like watching that stuff it just makes your shadow side go Ugh. okay everybody's working on your test